Hello and welcome back to another video. I'm Mike, you're watching In The Mix, and today we're gonna to do another FL Studio Basics video. The last one we did was on Fruity Delay 2, and in that there was a lot of comments asking if I could do pretty much the same thing, but explaining Fruity Reverb 2 instead. So that's pretty much what we're gonna do. And we're gonna break it into two parts. So part one is just gonna be explaining what each of the buttons, dials, faders on the reverb does, and then part two will be showing how you can actually use this in a mix if you want to. So let's get straight into it and learn how to use this plugin. So I'm inside the project, and first things first, I've got this snare sample. Just sounds like that. I've got a little bit of processing on it. Just to brighten it up a little bit, that's all. There's no reverb yet, and I'd like to add some reverb to this. So the first thing you do is go over to the effects chain. Now it's either going to be on the right or the left-hand side of your mixer, and then add Fruity Reverb 2. So it'll be in this list somewhere, and mine's just under delay and reverb. So when you add it, it'll sound like this to start off with. There's quite a lot of dials and sliders on this, but we're just going to take them one by one and it will be pretty simple. Uh, you'll get the grip of it in no time. So the first thing to get your head around is this little section over here. So this is dry, early reflections, and wet. So the dry is the initial snare sound. So if I turn the wet all the way down and we just hear the dry, you can unprocess signal. Now if I turn the wet all the way up and take the dry all the way down, we just hear the reverb. As a beginner, you won't need to worry about this ER dial too much. It sets the relative level of the first uh, reverberation or reverb, but it's not that important right now. So once you have your head around the dry and the wet, what I'm gonna do is turn the dry all the way down and turn the wet up. And this means that although this isn't actually how we'd put reverb on a snare, I'm just gonna do this so that you can really easily hear the differences that all the other dials make. So if you were wanting to put reverb on a snare, you wouldn't turn the dry all the way down but this is just so that you can hear the differences really easily. So going back over to the other side, the first two dials are here. So we have a low cut and a high cut. Now at any time if this gets confusing, remember to look up into this box in the corner and it should give you an idea of what you're hovering over and also what value you're uh, moving the dial to. So in this case it's saying low cut and there you go, 1000 hertz, 500 hertz, etc. So Low cut is pretty self-explanatory. If you low cut, you're removing the low frequencies from the reverb. So I'm gonna keep pressing the snare and I'm gonna gradually remove low frequencies. Pretty self-explanatory. This one's really good for cleaning up a mix. So if you've got something with reverb on it, remove some of the lower frequencies. It's not so muddy anymore. So I'm gonna middle click this dial to return it to its original value, and we're gonna to go to the high cut. So in this case, this cuts out high frequencies. So all the way over to the right, there's no high cut. All the way over to the left, there is a high cut. And it'll show you. So I'll keep it all the way open for now. So, so I'm gonna start with it all the way open, so there's no high cut. Then I'm gonna gradually just pull it in. So you can hear that there's a lot less high frequencies in this sound. So I'm going to just middle click to return that to its initial value. So the next dial up here is called pre-delay. And what this does is this determines how much of a gap there is between the dry signal and hearing the reverb. So in this case I'm going to have to turn the dry signal back on to hear this effect. So in this case, if I just put it to here and I press, you can hear that there's a gap between the sound and hearing the reverb. And this really, really helps separate the two sounds and also place it in a room, as well as the size and uh, diffusion pattern down here. So that's what the pre-delay does and you can either set it to be a tempo-based pre-delay, which is what I had, where it snaps to the values of your tempo, or you can just have any value you like. Room size is the next dial. So you can also see the little uh, picture on the left-hand side moving to uh, display the change in room size, and if you want to, you can actually click and move the cursor up and down to change the room size just, just from here. But I'm gonna stay with this dial, and you should hear the difference. If I use a big room size, or if I use a small room size,
and the diffusion pattern, it's sort of like how separated the reverberations will be. So if I make them small, just hearing the reverbs here. They sort of separates out all the little reflections or meshes them all together. So hopefully we're getting the grip of this. We've got the low cut, the high cut, pre-delay, changing the size of the room and changing the diffusion pattern of the room. These three dials here, bass, crossover and damping are not as, not as important for a beginner, but this decay time is very, very important. So the decay time is fairly self-explanatory. It's the length of time it takes the reverb to decay down to minus 60 dB. Now minus 60 dB is pretty quiet. So in this case, I'm gonna take it to four seconds. And if you count, two, three, four, it's essentially gone. If I make it all the way high, say 20 seconds, it's just gonna go on forever. If the decay time is too long, the overlapping tails of the reverb uh, will sort of build up. So if you have a drum beat with a, I don't know, a slowish tempo, you can afford a slightly longer decay time. That's sort of okay, the reverb's quite quiet by the time the next strike occurs. However, if this is longer time, and I'm gonna keep hitting this snare, it's just a big, like, huge rumble of noise. So the decay time's really important for making the reverb appropriate. So the high damping, we'll start with that. This does something similar to the high cut, but it's sort of dealing with slightly different frequencies and slightly different algorithms. So if I open it all the way up so that we can hear it, and then open the high damping. This one sounds almost like it's reflecting off a, a metal plate or something and being just dampened, whereas this one feels really open and light and airy. So it's I tend to use this in conjunction with the high cut to get just the right amount and sort of type of high end in the reverb. So the crossover determines what frequencies are affected by this bass dial, and the bass dial pretty much changes the decay time of the bass frequencies, and this drastically changes uh, how lively a room sounds. So if I turn this all the way down, and all the way up, I'm gonna include the dry signal in this as well. all the way counterclockwise, and you'll hear that the, the decay time of the bass is very, very fast. Uh, the, the room is quite dead, almost. All the way, somewhere in the middle, the bass frequencies get a chance to decay, all the way over to the side, and the bass frequencies just keep rumbling. Down here, we have the stereo separation. Now this stereo separation only affects the reverb signal, not the dry signal, and I should say the same about the low and high cut. The low and high cut don't actually affect the dry signal going through, so if you cut a lot of low frequencies out of the reverb, say you were putting reverb on a kick drum for some reason, low cutting all the way up to 3000 hertz will not cut all of that away from the kick drum. If you cut that away from the kick drum, it, it wouldn't have any thump, it wouldn't have any of the uh, body or warmth of a kick drum. So these only affect the reverb. This stereo separation is the same, it only affects the reverb. So I'm gonna turn it all the way over to the left hand side for maximum stereo separation. All the way over to the right, just for mono. This one I find is useful for hiding reverbs or separating them out. So if you have sort of two quite similar reverbs, potentially on different instruments, say you had a, a piano and maybe a marimba and their reverbs were just trailing off, you could sort of force one into mono, force one a little bit wider and it separates them out in the room. Sometimes a good little trick. The very last uh, switch is this mid side button and this determines whether the mid information or the side information of the input signal will be processed by the reverb. If you're going to select side then your input needs to have stereo information otherwise there won't be any effect by the reverb. Uh, you'd have to have, if you were using a mono signal you'd just have to use a mid anyway. So that's pretty much 
what all the dials do, but I haven't really explained necessarily how to use it besides a few little uh, tips and tricks. So let's get into that right now. So this session is one of our original songs called Brighter, and there's this little section here. I try to And in this section, there's a little bit of acoustic guitar sort of uh, making rhythmic or percussive noises, just strumming like this. And we used fruity reverb here to drastically change uh, the atmosphere of these strums. So I'll turn off all the effects and then I'll turn them on. So the first thing I did was just use an EQ to remove some of the lower frequencies, but then we opened up the reverb and what we were trying to do was just get as much high end out of this as possible and really make these notes shimmer. So in this case I've opened up the high cut all the way and I've got the decay time set so that it's not just turning into a big wash. but that it's not so short that it just sounds like a clock. And it sort of adds a little bit of shimmer, a little bit of tension there, uh, gets the track moving. Now there's lots and lots of different ways to use reverb. That is a whole video in its own right. But essentially, when using reverb, there are no rules. There's not really a lot of rules in making music anyway, besides uh, you know general pitch and timing. Everything else is quite experimental. Uh, you can have crazy big long uh, reverbs. You can have really bass heavy boomy reverbs if you want to. You can have high shimmery reverbs. You can have reverbs that last for a very long time or very very short reverbs. A few of my own tips would be to make sure that you are uh, low cutting reverbs. If they don't need low information I would recommend removing that out. When you're just looking at one reverb in solo it usually sounds quite good to have the bass there but when you sort of sum up 10, 20, 30, 40 different tracks that some of them, a lot of them might have reverb and if they've all got that low element you're just building up an awful lot of low rumble. And the second thing would be the room size and the decay time. When trying to pick an appropriate reverb for something like a vocal or a drum or a clap or a click, try to think about the room you want to put your reverb into and remember that your ears are actually really, really good at knowing whether something is appropriate or not. If I clap in this room, it sounds like this room. Now if I want to imagine that my track was being played inside a cathedral and I clap, I wouldn't want it to sound like that anymore. I'd want it to sound much, much uh, grander. I'd basically want it to mimic that space. So sometimes if you're mixing, if you just sort of close your eyes and, and try to imagine the space you want your sounds to exist in, you can often play a sample and keep tweaking the reverb until you close your eyes and you could imagine that you were in one of these uh, huge spaces. Now there are lots and lots of other types of reverb. Uh, and I reach for loads of different ones for different reasons, but Fruity Re Reverb 2 is a really great place to start. It's usually my go-to just for like experimenting and whatnot. And then sometimes I might swap it out for a different reverb. Hopefully this tutorial has helped you guys. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see any other FL Studio basic tutorials, simply let me know in a comment down below. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.